Hi everyone, um, welcome to the talk, uh, Call for Better Error Handling in APIs. My name is André Cedic. I'm the developer advocate for ShipCloud. We're a shipping service provider, uh, which means that we're connected to all the relevant shipping carriers that are on the market, DHL, UPS, uh, TNT, and we're providing them through a single REST API to our customers. Um, so it's basically the same thing that Stripe and PayPal are doing just for shipping. And um, after you've created a shipping label, we are also tracking those shipments. So um, you can always, uh, you're, you're always able to know um, where your shipping exactly is. Okay, um, when we started to work on uh, version two of our API, there were a few things we wanted to do better, obviously. Of course, the plan was to incorporate our learnings uh, from maintaining the API. Um, one part of that was that we wanted to make it easier for new and existing integrations uh, to work with our service. And while we're at it, true internationalization should be achieved, which meant making it possible to return translated strings in multiple languages or react to certain things uh, within our system and then uh, let the integration handle the um, messaging. This would also mean a first step into uh, making it possible to use our service as a true, in a true white label fashion. But most of all, what we needed was a better error communication. This is the way we are currently communicating errors uh, to our API consumers. Specifically, when a third party, like uh, in this case, the carrier Deutsche Post, um, is returning an error. We're showing an array of error messages, which is neither beautiful nor useful, uh, nor useful way of doing it. It's especially bad when you're factoring in that uh, consumers of our API will have to communicate this to their users. But first, let's have a look at how software errors are affecting our world. History of humanity is written by errors. Software development is no exception. Especially, missions into space are prone to costly errors. In 1962, NASA launched Mariner 1 into space to collect a variety of scientific data about Venus during a flyby. Unfortunately, 293 seconds after launch, the spacecraft veered off course after an unscheduled maneuver. Engineers had to hit the self-destruct button and uh, $18 million went up into flames. Investigation of the incident found out that a missing hyphen in the code allowed transmission of incorrect guidance signals. In 1962, uh, 1996, NASA launched the first Ariane 5 rocket from Kourou in French Guiana. 37 seconds into its main launch, engineers had to hit the self-destruct button because of a complete loss of its guidance systems. In this case, NASA reused software from previous Ariane rockets that was based on different data types. So the software in the end tried to push the 64-bit float into 16-bit integer resulting in a conversion failure and submitting a failure diagnostics uh, code as an input to the inertial reference system. Okay, one last space, ex space example. In 1998, NASA sent the Climate Orbiter to Mars to study its climate and serve as a communications relay for the polar lander. Unfortunately, a subcontractor on the engineering team failed to make a simple conversion from English to metric units Due to this, calculations for navigating the spacecraft into Mars's orbit were wrong and it was lost. Everyone knows the so-called millennium bug. When software was written in the 60s to 80s, engineers used a two-digit code to represent the year. As the year 2000 came closer, no one actually knew if double zero would be interpreted as 1900 or 2000. Since most of the critical infrastructure from that time 
uh, software was written um, in a way that the outcomes uh, could have become catastrophic for banks, transportation systems, and power plants. A whooping amount of money was poured into fixing software or preparing for damage control. In the end, aside from a few minor hiccups, nothing too bad happened. But as the saying goes, it's better to be safe than sorry. In 1994, uh, math professor, professor uh, Thomas R. Nicely noticed some inconsistencies in his calculations after adding a Pentium uh, system to his group of computers. A few days later, Nicely reported the issue to Intel. Since Intel didn't respond, he sent an email to several individuals and press outlets. <clears throat> and a week later, uh, the first story about the bug got released. CNN picked it up and aired a segment another two weeks later. Put under pressure, Intel acknowledged the bug, but claimed that it was not serious and would not affect most of their users. <coughs> Although correct, Intel later offered to replace all flawed processes after public pressure grew too big. So those stories already gave you a glimpse into how errors and their communication can be important. Let's head into two more examples of miscommunication and what they can lead to. After the victory in Europe, the, lead the Allied leaders called for Japan's unconditional surrender at the Potsdam Conference. Initially, the Japanese government said nothing while they were considering their options. When the press forced Prime Minister Kantaro Suzuki for a comment, he only said one word. Mukusatsu. It was a poor choice of words since the word has multiple different meanings. All the prime minister wanted to say was no comment, what we usually know from uh, politicians. Instead, the press translated it to not worthy of comment. The allied leaders were so enraged that 10 days later, the atomic bomb was dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A more recent example in the beginning of 2018, the midnight shift supervisor of the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency began a ballistic missile defense drill at a shift change. Although the message transmitted started with the words, exercise, 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 it contained the text of a message for a live ballistic missile alert, including the language, this is not a drill. Unfortunately, the UIs for sending out Alerts were using the same wording for drill and real alerts, and no additional safeguards were in place at the time. It took the agency 38 minutes to send out a retraction to the Hawaiian public because there was no response protocol for a false alert. So as you can see, not communicating in a clear way can lead to a lot of bad things happening. Okay, let's head back to APIs, since this is what we're here for. The late Joe Armstrong made, his, made this quote in his go-to conference talk in uh, 2018. Building fault-tolerant software boils down to detecting errors and doing something when errors are detected. Which is very fitting, I think. Unfortunately, error handling in APIs is done in a lot of different ways at the moment. Let's have a look at the tools we're leveraging today. HTTP response status codes are one of the most basic things communication between systems relies on. They have, a three di they have three digits and are categorized into five main groups. They start with the number one to five. So the status codes from the 100s to 300s aren't too interesting for our use cases, but the 400s and 400, 500s are the current sweet spot when it comes to error handling. As you can see, here are a few examples of what APIs today, today are using to communicate uh, an error has occurred. Aside from HTTP status codes, most APIs are returning more information about what actually happened in the responses body. The good thing about this is that you can return complex structures and therefore get into real detail about what went wrong. You also have a way of telling the client that more than one thing went wrong 
which is something HTTP status codes can't, since they have one integer value and that's it. Unfortunately, everyone has their own way of communicating errors. And so the developers who are integrating an API will have to understand the intent of the API's author. Here's a brief overview of how bad error handling can make things complicated for consumers of an API. Let's head back to our example from the beginning. So what's bad about this? Um, as I've previous, previously mentioned, we're returning multiple lines of error messages without any information about their severity. The first error message points to an error on the client side. Um, so when described as an HTTP status code, it would be more like a 400 bad request. The second error message sounds a bit like it has to do with authentication. So its status code would be more like a 403 forbidden. Also, using this approach of just returning multiple strings as error messages, it's nearly impossible to have them be translated into another language without doing a one-by-one -one mapping. The SaberDev Studio API docs, um, in those you can read about their error handling. Uh, the documentation shows a code attribute, which I'll be talking about in a minute, and uh, an error attribute, which is always a string. Unfortunately, it's not clear what the meaning of this error attribute is. Sometimes it's written in uppercase, so it seems to be something like a key, so that's the field. And at other times, it looks more like an error trace when it says external service returned error in somewhere. So very weird. The purpose of the error code is also not so easy to understand. Sometimes it's, it looks like an HTTP status code. And at other times, it looks more like something that's used for handling specific error cases. Weirdly enough, those codes are used more than once. So they can have multiple meanings, as you can see in this example. OK, Pitney Bowes. Here's an example uh, from their documentation. They've grouped their error codes into groups, which is a neat thing to do. Interestingly, each attribute that can be transmitted to their API has a validation of its own that contains an, its own error code if something goes wrong. Although it seems to be nice to have a way to pinpoint an error to a specific field, adding checks for all those different error codes in a UI can be quite some work. Although they're, uh, they're, um, although, although they're very thorough when it comes to communicating errors, as I've just shown, um, in other cases, they're combining errors to return a single error code, which has multiple meanings. As you can see here, some error codes are telling us that an attribute is either invalid, unsupported, or missing. So in the end, it's up to the developer to decide what actually went wrong. Not even Google is immune to bad error communication. When making requests to their Google Maps geocoding API, the response contains an attribute called status. It can have one of the seven values shown. Interestingly, even Google wasn't able to map an HTTP status code to each of those statuses while a 400 bad request gets returned when the response has invalid request as status, a 200 OK will be returned when the status is over query limit. Well, in the latter case, one would normally return something like a 429 too many requests to indicate that you've actually hit a limit. Next up, 
the Google Drive API, which returns an error object. It has a code attribute that resembles the HTTP status code that was returned, a message attribute, which should give a short description of why errors are being returned, and an errors attribute that contains an array of errors. What's a little weird about this is they have one entry error in singular, while they return multiple errors within an object. While we're talking about multiple errors in a single response, on the left, you can see how Klarna handles the single error. What directly catches your attention is that they are returning an error object. Instead, they prefix their error communication attributes. Also, they return the attribute error message for a single error and an attribute called error messages when there are more than one errors. Not very straightforward, I think, since one has to check two attributes when integrating their API. One particularly interesting example is the API football API. All responses are encapsulated in the API root attribute. Since all calls are get requests to query for infos, the response always has a results attribute, which can be zero. And errors are returned through the error attribute. Unfortunately, their documentation go doesn't go into details or shows more examples than the one you see here on the right. So it seems that they're only able to handle a single error. OK, OK, that's been a lot of bad things I've been showing you. Now let's see some good parts. And maybe we can learn something from that. Squarespace is handling errors by adding attributes to the root of the response. Categorization in type and subtype makes it easy to group errors. So maybe you just want to handle specific error groups. They have an attribute called message as a way to transport, transmit a short message to the developer. And a details object that is intended for machine readable usage, as they say in their documentation, and uh, where user-friendly error messages uh, will be in. Unfortunately, that's where the information about the details, uh, details objects stop. So from the documentation, you can't find out the really nitty gritty stuff. One particularly good thing, though, is they are providing a context ID, which uh, you can use to contact their support team. Facebook's Graph API encapsulates their error communication and error object as we've seen in a few examples already. This shields it from the rest, so errors and response data doesn't mix. They have a code and uh, subcode attributes, which are a little bit like the type and subtype from uh, Squarespace. This again makes grouping of errors uh, possible. Aside from code and subcode, they have two attributes, attributes called message and uh, type, which are strictly there for developers to find out what's wrong. Error user title and error user message can be used for showing the user what has happened. What's so cool about this is uh, they're actually stating in their documentation that the language of the message is based on the locale of the API request. So you don't have to worry about translating uh, the error message for locates you're supporting. Just like Squarespace, Facebook is returning a so-called FB trace ID uh, that you can use for communicating with their support. The marketing, FB, uh, marketing API from Facebook uses the same structure we just saw. But they're expanding it by adding an object called error data in there, you have an array of arrays called blind field specs that shows when the, where the error originates from. Here's an example for having errors in two different places. For whom this might look a little weird, I have an example from the JSON API standard using JSON pointers. Uh, 
that uh, looks a little bit more like something one would use. One field where error communication is very important are banking apps. Here's an example from the bank's API documentation. As you can see, they are returning a short message and uh, details that um, ought to be displayed to the user. They also have an attribute called code and one called level, which resembles a little bit uh, something like error logging from programming languages like Java, where you have a log level that actually defines the severity of an error. At the moment, the level error contains cases like invalid bank transfer or access blocked, while the error level info returns entries like 10 input required or when you have messages from your bank. The banking service provider Figo once again is handling errors by grouping them via their code attribute. When they have more information about what went wrong, it goes into the data object. Interestingly, entries in the data attribute are arrays, so returning multiple errors is kind of possible. But I'm not sure why they have this uh, group element, since, uh, as you can see on the right, uh, they're actually grouping errors by the code. Maybe there's an exception to the rule. Okay, here, here's the thing, what everyone's been dying to wait for. So with all these examples, is there a holy grail of error communications in API? As I just tried to show you, we as API providers are still struggling to find a common way, especially when it comes to communicating what went wrong to the end user who's actually using the product that's integrated your API. But what's the actual problem we're facing today? I think it was uh, Phil Sturgeon from uh, Stoplight.io who once said, API calls either fail or are successful. And interestingly, that's what the bank's API and others are already hinting at there is a third way. Sometimes these things happen that I call soft errors or warnings or something like that. They aren't the usual 500 internal server error type of errors where everything is like crash and burn, crash and, burn and we have to stop now. No, they're more like warnings that something happened you might have to look at. For us at ChipCloud, this is the case when one of the systems we're talking to returns a message that looks a little like this. Here we have five examples of additional information we get in the response. To fully understand the conundrum, I have to add that the carrier that we're talking to at the time was able to create a shipping label. Therefore, they returned a 200 OK as a status code, and the customer who initiated the request will get charged for uh, that API call. As you can see from these messages, our customers might run into trouble if we don't communicate these to them because uh, they might get charged extra for uh, a shipment that uh, needs special handling to be delivered. So as you now understand, the type of problem is that APIs providers might face when having to deal with these soft errors or warning type of errors. Um, here are a few tools that are out there on the market and, are and could potentially make things easier for you. Something uh, Eric Wilde mentioned uh, in his second talk yesterday is uh, the problem plus JSON uh, standard. It's uh, defined in RFC 7807. Uh, and introduced uh, that content type that's uh, up there. It has a predefined set of attributes, but can be extended if you need to have more stuff 
to convey what actually went wrong. Unfortunately, there are a few things I don't think are helpful. First of all, it's not encapsulated uh, in an errors object. Therefore, error-specific data and uh, data from the resource uh, that could be returned um, are mixing. So you don't know what's actually something uh, that comes from the error and something that's from the resource. So it's more intended for those uh, crash and burn type of errors where you have to stop and communicate the error right away. RFC 7234, which is describing the caching part of HTTP 1.1, brings us the warning header. With it, you get the option to warn a user about something by returning one or more warning headers that contain an error code, as you can see here on the right, um, a short message to uh, convey what went wrong, and a timestamp to see uh, the time uh, of occurrence. Unfortunately, with, uh, it's, it's the same thing like the HTTP status codes. Uh, it's just a, it's, okay, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a code, so it's more like a subcode or something. Um, and uh, the rest is just a simple string. Uh, so complex error cases um, where you actually need a structure to convey what was going on um, can't really get, uh, can't really be used in that. You, you could write a parser or something, but uh, that's, uh, that doesn't look uh, too good. Okay, just to go a bit off topic, and uh, that's actually one thing Eric also mentioned in his talk yesterday. Um, they're, uh, conveying uh, the severity of a problem is one of the key things I'd uh, really like to see in an API response. Interestingly, there is currently an ID um, for a standardized health check response. Um, and uh, in that response, it defines an attribute called status up there that can either have uh, pass, warn, or error as a value. Interesting fact, in the corresponding GitHub repo, um, there's a, a, a discussion going on about what HTTP status code uh, one should use since uh, warning doesn't have anything that's matching. Okay, the rest is a little bit too specific for that use case, but uh, you get the point. As I've uh, already hinted at, the JSON API standard introduces the use of JSON pointers to make it possible for developers to pinpoint the problem of an API request. You have a status, uh, which resembles the HTTP status code, and a code uh, entry to tell you more about what actually happened. But again, unfortunately, there's no way of returning those uh, warning type of errors. So that's where uh, the error handling stops. Okay, to sum it up, uh, what we just saw in the previous examples, here are a few best current practices you can follow to do good on your error communication. You should have HTTP status codes. Okay, that's, that's basic, everyone has it, um, but you should use the right ones. You should put uh, your error communication in an error object so it's encapsulated and uh, shielded from the rest, or the rest is shielded from the error messaging. Um, you should add something for referencing errors, so something like code and subcode uh, would be ideal. Um, you should also add a request ID, as you saw in the examples uh, for Squarespace and uh, Facebook, which makes it easier to uh, identify what actually went wrong when you have uh, good logging in the back end and uh, you can just search for 
the request ID. And of course, you should have human readable error messages uh, in, if it's possible, uh, multiple languages, if that's something you would like to give to your customers. Gal Evan from Restcase once wrote in a blog post, an excellent error message is precise and lets the user know about the nature of the error so that they can figure uh, their way out of it. And I think that's uh, perfectly fitting for what we're trying to achieve. Okay, so here's the thing everyone's been dying to wait for, my actual call for proposal, um, which I would love for you to take as a starting point for getting in touch with me and others uh, so we can find a common ground and maybe create a new standard for communicating errors in APIs. I have two examples. Uh, I'm not too sure if everyone can see it in the back end. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it. It's, uh, it's a little unfortunate that you can't see that. Um, it's actually uh, what I would love to propose is um, a new format. Uh, everything that can be returned is encapsulated in uh, an attribute. Um, you have a data attribute, which holds everything we normally have in the root, uh, which is something um, uh, some providers like, some API providers like uh, Twitter are already doing. Um, so everything that you normally get when you have a 200 OK response uh, is in there. Um, this is just a basic example from our API, so it uh, doesn't matter what's in there. <clears throat> um, as you can't see, unfortunately. Um, this, is, uh, this is basically um, what we would return when one of those warning type of errors um, uh, occur. So you have a warnings attribute, uh, which is an array of objects. And every object in there is one uh, actual uh, error that happened, or warning. Um, they follow the uh, RC7807 pattern. So that's something uh, companies are already using. Uh, companies like uh, Zalando, um, Adidas, and a few others uh, are using that. Um, and to convey the fact uh, that there is a warning, I also added the warning header, uh, which is up there. Um, it's currently uh, 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 214. Um, as a code, which uh, sa is, uh, it's, uh, it maps to um, transformation applied. So something happened in the back end, um, and you should notify the user. And of course, um, as uh, no real actual crash and burn errors uh, happened, the errors object uh, is empty. And we have a request ID up there. And on the right, um, this is the, the normal use case where um, a hard error happened and uh, something went wrong and you actually have to stop right now. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's uh, the same format. Um, you have the errors object in there, um, which conveys the actual uh, hard problem. Um, and uh, there's no data since no data got created. And uh, you also have the warnings attribute. Um, so depending on the API, uh, one could return warnings at the same time while returning errors. Yeah? What is this uh, data, which, or what could it be? Um, it yeah, um, uh, let me go back. Um, data is actually. Uh, the data that you'd normally get when you have a, uh, a request uh, that's okay. So in our case, if the customer sends us data to create a shipping label, uh, 
um, and we're able to create that shipping label, the data that we normally uh, transmit in the responses route is uh, in the data attribute now. So it just moves in there. I hope. <laughs> Exactly, and um, maybe to just give you a short uh, glimpse into the RFC pattern, um, what we have in here is a, a detail uh, entry um, which uh, tells you more about what happened, which is actually a message you can uh, um, display in the UI. You have your error code for um, for when you uh, would like to uh, react on the, uh, in the software side to that error and uh, don't want to transmit the error message that's in uh, detail. Um, you have an instance, if an instance got created, like in this case, um, where you have a shipping label that's addressed by an ID, you actually have the instance uh, and uh, can call it through the, that uh, URL. Um, you have the status, which resembles the HTTP status code. A title, um, which is more or less like uh, a short warning, which you could, would display somewhere, I think, in the header or uh, somewhere on a page. And uh, you define types, which can be um, your eyes um, to pinpoint you to a more specific uh, um, documentation about uh, what happened. Are there any questions? Uh, I was actually pretty fast, uh, so if you have questions uh, or would like to discuss the proposal, um, I'm free. And thank you. <laughs>